afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Christine Twig from Health Education England. Um, this afternoon, we're going to be welcoming you to the Healthcare Projects and Change Association webinar. Um, it's workshop number one, Shaping Your Story, which is about um, how you can create effective storytelling. It's going to be presented by Dr. Bryn Hodgkiss, from, who's Head of Transformation Strategy from NHS England. The session is going to be, um, as you can see, it's going to be recorded and it's going to be shared in the K-Hub community and our YouTube, YouTube channel. That's a bit difficult to say that, isn't it? YouTube channel. Um, for those who aren't already on K-Hub, I will put the sign up link in the chat and also the link to our YouTube channel. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Bryn Hodgkiss. So take it away, Bryn. Wonderful, Christine. Uh, can everyone hear me before I launch into it? Because there's always that embarrassing moment when you are at your most articulate and realize after three minutes and no responses that you are on mute. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming along, especially straight after lunch. Uh, and thank you for the great introduction, Christine. Um, you know, this is kind of like you, you've, in, you've, you've sort of agreed to have a house party and suddenly loads of people turn up. So 141 people pitching up. I'm like, kind of, oh, gosh, that's a lot. But no worries. Um, I'm sure I can cope. Thank, um, this webinar is a follow up on a, a small talk I gave a couple of weeks ago on the power of storytelling in digital transformation. And then Particularly, we had a poll at the end of that uh, at the end of that presentation asking what would people like to find out more about stories, and that's what's informed this webinar and and will inform the next one. Um, yeah, oh, thank you, Joanne. It's flattery will get you everywhere with me. Um, but if you want to see that previous talk, it's it's also in the the K Hub space and will also be on YouTube. So. Um, to give you a bit of my background, for those of you who missed the first one, uh, I'm a psychologist by background, worked in various places uh, with everyone from police officers to serial murderers and and now to working within the, the NHS in large scale transformation. And one of the strands that I've sort of become more and more interested in thinking about how we can deliver change is using storytelling. Um, I've delivered some of this training privately, so in the interest of anyone in our legal and compliance department, I'm not getting paid for this. There's no conflict of business interest, so please don't panic. Uh, you aren't all participating in a crime. Um, but what 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 I really love about storytelling is it's not going to solve all our problems, but it's going to give us another tool in our toolkit when we think about delivering change. So this quote is from Daniel Kahneman. Now, those of you um, who do some reading in the background around behavioral economics and nudge theory, Daniel Kahneman is the grandfather of nudge theory. And this quote was quite surprising when I first read it because it came from someone who is a Nobel Prize winning scientist. Uh, figures are his, his reason for being. But that's what he found is no one ever made a decision because of a number and they need a story. So what are we going to cover here today? So very briefly, what was covered last time? Um, to give you a bit of background, apologies, that was a dog insisting to come in. Um, firstly, how do we usually try influence people and why it works so badly? How stories have been used in digital projects and change initiatives and then we'll, um, I mentioned we did a poll, but the reason projects, um, but before I leap on, just to recap on the reason we often try influence people, um, sorry, apologies. When we influence people, as Daniel Kahneman suggests, we rely on facts and figures. And there's an increasing body of research in from neurology that suggests that actually, when we are confronted with facts which contradict our already held beliefs, there is a strong, almost backfire response. Uh, people will um, 
find a load of explanations, they will perceive those contradictory facts almost as an attack. And when they feel attacked, they will be more likely to put up other explanations for the data they are seeing. Um, and there's a number of different elements of research which, which backs that one up. By contrast, how stories work on a neurological level is through this, it, it sounds really cool in Star trek -y, neural coupling. So what it found is a series of studies were done on the influence on your, your brain of being told a story. And the most significant finding was that your um, your brain, your the emotions in your brain, as you are being told a story, as you're being led through a story by a storyteller, starts to mirror the that person's story. And interestingly, some of the the um, the effect on that can be seen to have a listening to a compelling story has been shown to have a longer term effect on people's perceptions of a problem. So I know in certain healthcare settings, people are thinking about how can I get patients to tell other patients their story of, for example, complying with a regime of medicine, because hearing that story from other patients is more likely to affect the patient behavior than it would be if I just told them. Um, but anyway, I won't go into the theoretical background anymore. We want to get on with some practical stuff. So by the end of the session, we've done the recap on the psychology of stories um, already, but we're going to get some tools for finding compelling stories and then a guide for structuring the stories. Um, because it was what you asked for, but also I was glad you did because quite often I've, I've given this training and I've always had the niggling fe feeling people come afterwards and say, wow, that was really interesting. But then I didn't know what to do next. So the theory was wonderful. It was all fascinating, but I didn't have any practical hints. So I'm I'm very much focused today on the, the practical hints. First thing, finding stories. So if I were running this as a longer workshop, we, we would have a session where I would say, what are your reasons for not using stories? And then as a group, we, we'd work through how we break that down um, as, you know, in, in our initiatives. Uh, one of the things that comes up most often is people saying, um, well, I don't know any good stories. I don't find any, you know, I'm, I'm not a natural storyteller. And that's the first thing if you take nothing else away is to realize how much we are swimming in a sea of stories they're all around us all the time we just don't notice it yet um and i'm going to give you the first of three hints now to how you find a story so just to prove it because i don't like suggesting anything unless i've tried it myself um I take loads of notes in, in my meetings and every time I've spotted a story using this technique, I've made an I've put a little a little orange post it like that in my book to mark where I found the story. Um, and this morning I pulled out my last it's a, it's about just over probably two years, maybe three years worth of books. I'll hold it up to the camera. And you can see <laughs> all those little orange markers or every time I come across a story that I can then use in my work to motivate for change or for not. I mean, just to prove to bring it right up, that's my current book now, um, to prove that actually the stories are all around you and very much the same as probably, I don't know, I don't know most of you, but I'm I'm mostly office based. I'm in one of those roles where I'm I'm not close to the front line. I'm not seeing patients every day. I'm not seeing clinicians every day. But there's still those stories you can use to to create change. First marker, time, place, direct speech. So when somebody says to you, uh, when they start in in a conversation, start mentioning. I got told this by someone and reporting direct speech when they start to say, oh, well, when I was working in in HEE, my director would always say blah or when. So any one of those things, you know, you're being told a story. Um, 
and then your ears can prick up and you can start to think, is this a story could, that could then be something I could then use? Um, and I should have said, as I go through, if you do have questions, pop them in the chat and I'll get to and I'll sort of answer them as I go, um, just in case you don't have time for, for questions at the end. So the next hint for finding stories, so you get time, place, direct speech. The next one is following the feels. So our memories are built around emotions. Um, and I, again, I could go into the neurology of how that works, but every time a memory is laid down, there's, a, there's an emotional marker that gets attached to that. And very often, certainly I find this technique really useful probably with finding more personal stories or for invoking stories in people, is concentrating on those emotional events that, that you might have come across. So, for example, um, thinking about something that, thinking about a time that a task really worked well, thinking about something that really upset you, really made you angry, in there is the kernel of an important story and a story that people will listen to, which again is is something I'll I'll come back to in a second. Um, I'll I'll pause there. So we've got story markers, following the feelings. So pay attention to what is emotional. Pay attention to pay attention also to what's emotional to the team. Because very often in change projects, we'll be talking quite abstractly. We'll be talking about processes or milestones, but the stories that often motivate behavior will be often those emotional events for people and those memories from previous change. And then thirdly, and I should have warned you, um, I warned the, in the last webinar, if, if hand-drawn um, pictures are not your thing, this is going to be a long, long 45 minutes. Um, the last one is nuclear events. Now that I, I'm not, despite the illustration, I'm not referring to, to bombing. It's about, it's a, it's a concept from narrative psychology is about those flashbulb events, which everyone can remember. Um, so it could refer to a big turning point in your individual life. So what was a nuclear event? around a, a life change, an illness, a career transition, or, and I think for our context, this might be more relevant, a major event in an organization or a team that everyone knows where they were when that happened. So, you know, an example would be 9-11. Uh, everyone knows where we were when 9-11 happened or the death of the Queen we were all touched by that and recently um well less recently than the death of the queen but covid covid is a fantastic nuclear event and the effects of the pandemic and again you can draw stories out or build common stories around those nuclear events so i've seen stories about how we worked as covid become really common or how we worked during covid sorry become really common so again that's another source. Those nuclear events are another source of, of stories. And I think in my last webinar, I gave an example of, um, I believe it might be in the last one. If not, I'll come back. Uh, uh, often trusts uh, of a, a trust using a nuclear event involving a patient safety incident as a way to sort of motivate for, for change. I'll pause there for, for a second and say, are any immediate questions about finding stories? I'm keeping an eye on the clock and we're running ahead of time. No, wonderful. So, so one of the things you might be, so once you like, you're looking out for story markers, you're following the fields, you're thinking about how you can turn a nuclear event into the story. The next question you're probably asking is, OK, how do I now structure these stories? 
and how do I make them more compelling? Because it's all very well having a little post-it note in your in your day book. It's that's quite different from where you might want to then structure a story and present it. Um, in my in the previous webinar, I had mentioned different contexts you could use your story in, and I'm just going to mention that again because that's going to probably affect how you how you listen. Is you could be you could use your individual story um, at a portfolio level to explain the reason why your whole portfolio of work or programs exist. So, for example, a strategic story would be one like in my day job, I would tell about digital urgent and emergency care and why it exists and what value it brings to the NHS in, in England. But then you could, so that's one level you could use a story at, but the other would be at an individual project level. And an individual project level would be like, well, why why is this change initiative or why is this project being done? Um, and that would possibly be, and again, I gave an example of that would be when you could use sort of a set of patient stories explaining the benefit. What's the benefit of this project to me as a patient? Um, or what's the benefit for a clinician? So that could be at a project level how you'd use stories. And then finally, thinking about you could also use stories like in a meeting, almost in a single interaction. Um, so that would be about framing the conversation in a meeting or trying to encourage uh, people to agree to action, action in a single conversation and using a story as a lever for doing that. Um, so the hints I've given about finding stories could be applied to any of those types of stories. But in terms of structuring stories, you probably would want to think about what structure would best suit the setting you are about to deliver your story in. Because if you are doing a strategic workshop with um, you know, stakeholders from across the system and you want to tell the strategic story of why your program exists, you've got more time. You've got more op opportunity to do interactive tools and you can then tell a longer story and use a longer structure. But if you got in a meeting and you want to land a point quickly, you, you would want to be doing it much more quickly and possibly just with words. Um, but onwards. So. The first tip about um, telling a story is finding a way to make people's brains pay attention. So we we are exposed to, on average, um, about a million stimuli at any one time. Um, that's that's what every all of the sensations that are coming into our body all at once. But our brains are fantastic filter. We can only really pay attention to about 14 of those. And everything else gets filtered out. And there's a there's a great and, and I know many of you will know this experiment, but there's a great experiment on perception that was done. I think it was back in the 70s, actually, where a, um, a research participant was asked to pay attention to a video of two people throwing a ball between each other and count how many times that ball was thrown from person A to person B, um, and they'd be marked on, on how well they did. And what the researchers found was that people would be so focused on the task of counting th that they would, um, they would not notice distractions going on in the background. Um, so one of those distractions was a person running on in a, in a gorilla suit beating their chest in the background and then um, running off again. And they found that a very substantial proportion of people did not notice the gorilla. And that is because our brain will only pay attention to what is salient. That salient is that is what is relevant and applicable to us right then. So the first thing you need to do with your story is establish salience for, for the listener. Um, and I learned this. The, I learned this the hard way. Um, about um, 
establishing salience because it was something I often wouldn't do. I'd just launch into a story and then wonder, like normally by the end of me speaking, people kind of saw the point, <laughs> but certainly not when I started. So this is something I've I've had to learn. So the first most obvious thing is tell people why to listen. So that, I don't know if that's a proper sentence, but tell people why they should listen rather. Um, and it doesn't need to be pedantic. You just say, you know what? Um, for example, before uh, you know, there's a before you go into a patient story, saying, do we? You, know, I'd heard from a patient about their experience of of getting letters from the NHS, and you know what? It's the best example of why we should uh, turn things electronic. Let me tell you why that is now. Um, or, you know, I, I wasn't sure about this project until I heard what Christine said to one of her colleagues. You're grabbing people's attention. You're telling them why they need to listen. Um, second way is using striking image imagery. So, um, and <laughs> yeah, sorry, Elaine, I just saw. Yeah, striking color. Keep it nice, bright, and yellow. Um, partly because of that, but I do apologize if if it's forcing some people to wear shades. Um, I, I think it's partly just, if I'm honest, Elaine, um, I was getting a bit tired of doing slides that were on NHS regulation white, because you think actually, if you if you want something to pop out, let's make it pop. Um, striking imagery. So use a picture of a gorilla or have that imagery built into your story. And this is where you can come back to some of the tools you use to find the story in the first place. So that the story markers, time, place, direct speech, though what's being said in direct speech can also give you a clue to some of the striking imagery there. Um, and Another example of using striking imagery is when I introduced myself, I mentioned that you know, I've worked with serial murderers. That's where my interest in serial murder came from, in serial murder, in stories came from, um, with going around prisons and finding out why guys did what they did. The reason I use that anecdote, it's not just by chance, it's because it's a striking image and people think, oh, Here's something I need to pay attention to now. So again, in telling your story, bring some of that. Um, if if you've got something that you've heard or that you've done that's interesting, use it as a way to snag people's attention um, and establish that salience. And then finally, don't be afraid of using emotions in your stories, because again, a lot of change management seems to be about um or another way sorry seems to be about removing emotions often often thinking about how can we sort of or project and program management it's very planning very logical very structured so we sometimes feel that we shouldn't bring emotions into our stories but emotions is what drives memory um and emotions is what then drives action and activity. So don't be afraid of using those emotions. And guess what? If you found um, if you found stories by following the fields, then that's going to be fairly easy for you to do. So for example, I mentioned, you know, a story about a, a, a patient uh, who I spoke with speaking about their experience of trying to access a GP and getting GP letters from the hospital, uh, or sorry, getting letters from the hospital asking them to to get an appointment with the GP. And her words were, every time um, I get a letter from the NHS, I feel less than human. Because I've got to sit and wait for a member of my family to come home before and read my letter my private letter about my health conditions to me before I know what I need to do. So again, that direct speech, 
that emotion that she's um, be, she's feeling is what uh, establishes salience in that story. Um, I'm just pausing to have a look through the chat. Um, and yeah, Leanne, that's a really good point around patient stories heard direct from the patients. I've experienced that myself. You know, it does. It is really very powerful. Um, and and probably in a lot of places that that's a real gold standard. Um, I think that the challenge can sometimes be um, if you've recorded the patient story, making sure you get permission for that to be shared more widely. Um, also, the challenge can sometimes be simply a logistic one of getting the patient into the place or room to record. And that's when, again, as a, as a fallback, you can record a patient story. So the patient story I just told, I do have a, a tape recording of it, but also I had sort of um, whittled it down into an anecdote that I could then use in forums like these to, to motivate for change. Um, I think, and just going back to something, um, Eliasar, I think the apologies if I've I've mispronounced your name, wrote in the chat about sometimes how people tell the story is more important than the story itself. Um, I think that there's an element of to which that's true. I think there's also um, so again sometimes uh, the thing I've learned is I'm not always the best person to tell the story. If someone can tell a story better than me or someone from the audience has a better example, then use them. So don't, you don't, it doesn't always need to be about you. It needs to be about the best person to, to uh, give that experience in the most impactive way. Um, I think the other thing, and this is quite the practical trick with stories, is often stories can evoke different responses in different people. And very often when you tell a story, people are going to want to then tell their own story back. So when you use your story, again, make it clear why people should listen, but also be ready to adapt to, to what may come then come back for them. Um, wonderful. I'm just catching up on, on the chat. And yeah, Alki, as you're saying, is... Um, Certainly, I think stories and um, stories and data should be a duet. And I like the idea of you use potentially a patient story and a patient's experience to hook people in, and then you use your data to back it up. But probably in the next, we can in the next uh, webinar around strategic stories, we could maybe go into more depth around that about how we use how we tell use our data to tell a story. Because um, again, that's a challenge that people people often think the the data speaks for themselves, it speaks for itself, and it doesn't. So, um, and that's just a, a parting thing on the the power of uh, emotions and emotional connection is that which is most personal is most universal. Um, by Carl Rogers. So again, it's why you use patient stories because everyone can identify with an experience, uh, a, a deeply human experience of being vulnerable or being sick or being afraid. Um, and we want to be connecting on that level. And yourselves as storytellers, don't be afraid of bringing your own emotions and your own vulnerability into, um, into the room because that actually builds more connection. Uh, people like people like themselves. Uh, we we like people that we feel we have similarities with. And if our emotions are the great human connector, then bring that to the fore because people are more likely to connect. Um, I just need to get back to my notes. Um, so story structures. This is what you can do then now that you've you've got your time you've got your time place space you've got your emotions you've established you think actually my i know what the story's about you know that's my, my my top level statement i can make to tell people why to listen it's all there 
OK, now what do I do? And I'll suggest three structures. First structure um, is Pixar. Uh, it didn't originate with Pixar, but this is the structure that uh, it's called the story spine that all Pixar movies use to to explain their story. So it's once upon a time, then every day. One day. Because of that, because of that until finally, and then ever since that day to give you an example. So um, once upon a time, there was a fish who lived in the ocean with his his little sunfish called Nemo. And um, every day, Daddy Fish would tell Nemo to be careful and not swim near the ocean. One day, Nemo swam too, too near the ocean and got swept out to sea. Because of that, Daddy Fish had to go out after him. And because of that, he made many friends until finally he rescued Nemo. And ever since that day, he learned a valuable lesson about friendship and and being um, and letting his son have independence and freedom. So next time you're watching a Pixar movie, try apply that structure. I've also found that structure pretty useful in telling stories if you've got a little bit more time to go through all those stages. Um, another one, this is probably more suitable for a very quick, impactive hit of story is disruption, crisis, um, and resolution. Um, and that's very simple. So for example, it, <laughs> sorry, Kim, I hope I haven't ruined Pixar for you. Rest assured, they've got lots of other tools. They layer over the top and they're much more skilled at storytelling probably than I'll ever be. But yeah, you can steal that. Um, the the turning point is disruption, crisis, resolution. So that would be. Um, it's actually a structure we often describe our own experience in. I cut my hand um, bleeding all down my arm. I didn't know where to go. Um, I tried to go to my GP. They didn't have any availability. I phoned 111. They said phone my GP. And then eventually I I just I went to A&E um, and they bandaged my hand up and they told me that actually next time I could probably go to a an urgent treatment center. Um, so disruption, crisis, resolution. Again, I find it quite useful in bringing out sort of the in helping remind me to bring out that crisis point more. Um, and I see, Julie, you've, you've mentioned uh, in the chat the stories that come on the, the Schwartz rounds and similar or using staff stories when you're nominating teams for values badges. Again, those sort of things are story gold mines. Um, so please do capture the stories that are happening and then use those stories to motivate for future change or to remind people of things that they have previously heard. Um, you might be asking yourself, oh gosh, am I stealing someone else's story here? Well, I don't see any problem with stealing with pride. Um, I would love that you would steal some of these slides with pride and apply, your, the, apply them in your day job. But if you steal the slides, I'd like you to acknowledge this is where I got them from. Exactly the same with another story. So if you heard a story in a Swartz round, do tell it, uh, you know, I heard the story from someone else. This isn't my story, but this is their experience. Um, so yeah, st st use other people's stories, but always acknowledge that you've got it from somewhere else uh, and avoid lying or make or saying that you did something or saying you did or delivered something that you didn't because that would of course get you found out um and then um the clarity story so this again is is a useful story when you don't have all the time for a pixar you've got a bit more time than for a turning point the clarity story I found quite useful in in thinking about sort of program and programmatic change. In the past, we used to do something one way, then something happened. So now 
and then in the future. So, for example, um, I'm just drawing one from my current day job, actually. In, in the past, uh, you know, everyone would just automatically go to emergency departments when they're ill. I know they don't, but let's let's indulge the cliche. Uh, everyone used to go to emergency departments or call the ambulances when they were ill. Um, but you know what? Then COVID came and what that really changed was people's perception of the value of digital tools. So now when we're thinking about designing the healthcare system, we're thinking about digital tools first. So in the future, we might have another way in which people can get into the urgent and emergency care system. Um, and as part of the clarity story, you can use probably what I didn't use there, some uh, sort of direct speech from patients or direct speech from clinicians or direct speech from um, from respected members of staff about about what they've done. Um, So I will actually, I'll just go back to my previous. And I'm just going to go again through the chat. Are there any questions? I see, uh, Tara, your, your question about um, how data doesn't always tell a story and how we could make it do so. I'm I'm wondering whether that's something we'll, we can bring up more in the next webinar around um, telling strategic stories, um, because I think often we, what, what I've seen um, is we often presume data is self-evident, but in preparing data, a lot of decisions have already been made about what to present and how, um, and often in presenting data, what I've seen certainly, and this is in, in, in my sort of working experience, people will assume everyone will read a graph in the same way. And an interesting example of why that doesn't always work as a standalone was from the Harvard gun crime study. Um, there's a, a study into gun crime in Harvard. Forgive me if some of you've heard the story before, but what that Harvard gun crime study found is they, they took two groups of people, some people who were very pro-gun, some people are very anti-gun um, gun ownership, um, and they gave them crime stats that contradicted their pre-existing views. So the people who really supported gun ownership were giving statistics showing that the more guns you own, the more crime there is. And the people who really opposed it were gifts shown the more guns they own, the lower the, the violent crime rate is. And did and then they once the people were shown the data, they were asked whether their opinion around crime, gun ownership had changed. And in most cases, it hadn't. Um, in fact, what it found is the more numerically literate someone is, the better able they are to, to explain their way around the, um, the data. So, and I've, I've seen this myself. Uh, people, uh, if the stats, if people don't like the statistics, they will say things like the sample size is not representative. The data is out of date. Um, I don't recognize the coding. Um, and again, you can always talk your way around what the data is showing. Um, but equally, data can, um, th there's often more complexity in the data than is easy to grasp unless you have the time. Um, and maybe in telling a strategic story, I can give some uh, examples of where I've seen that duet being done really well or of people who were very, very good at doing that. Um, just picking up Mark's point, uh, there, there, there is a risk uh, that a decision maker will be so swayed by a really compelling story, but that happens already. Um, and I think that's because um, I, I had a sort of almost an ethical concern when I started doing this work is, well, we're teaching people some Jedi mind tricks. Uh, is this going to be used uh, appropriately and ethically? And I think, 
And where I eventually came to is people are influenced by stories all the time. Um, we're influenced by, um, you know, and without being political, we're influenced by a big bus with letters written down the side of it. We're influenced by what we see on Twitter. We're influenced by what we hear on the news. Um, and by training people in realizing first the power of stories, what I'm in wanting to encourage is conscious practice. So rather than unconsciously just throwing a story out there and accidentally influencing, let's do it consciously and let's do it ethically. Um, reassuringly, I know the, the Harvard Business Review did a, a study of how executives make decisions. And it was about 1800 executives, I believe. None of them relied solely on data, but equally, none of them relied solely on stories. So store, um, stories, a compelling idea, that's best functioning as the hook, and then you come with the with the follow up data. But yes, absolutely. Um, I think the fact that use it consciously, because then there's a better chance you're going to use it for good. And I think actually Deborah in the chat, I think that might be the the study you are referring to. But I'll make a note to myself to follow up. Um, and. Sean, with your story, does um, I think they might bet they might offer a counter story. Um, but I would say that's an advantage in managing stakeholders is if they um, you by offering a counter story to your story, you better understand what their perceptions are. But equally, the only way you're going to beat their story is by telling a better story. If you know if someone if a paramedic is saying um how hard it is to do their job uh, and telling a story about a cardiac arrest patient you aren't going to convince them to work differently by showing them some figures about ambulance efficiency as in our handover times need to be better so yeah invite counter stories um, because that then helps us understand what people's concerns are and how we can better influence. Um, and then a final hint, um, start small. So I've given loads of hints. I've given some three different structures. I've given three different um, tools by which you could find stories, three structures which you could use to structure them, then a few other hints in between about how you can add to the salience of your stories, just pick one. Uh, pick one of those hints and practice and listen. Um, and as and as Sean said um, uh, in the chat about it's always good to listen, absolutely, because if you take one hint and practice it, you'll then and you look for feedback that is going to then encourage that that good listening cycle. Um, but in the minute we have, I have a a couple of polls. Now both of these polls are going to be up in the HPCA site. My first poll is going is very quickly about um, what proportion of this session's contents did you find useful? What was the most useful bit and what could I do do more of? Hop stuff in the chat about what you found really useful, what you think I should emphasize more. And I am not going to be heartbroken if you tell me that. Like there, it wasn't all an absolute goldmine. Because feedback's a gift and the more you tell me, the better I can make um, the next session. Um, so hopefully that poll is now live. And then the second poll, which I know will go on to um, the HBCA website, uh, so shared area, will be about the techniques for telling strategic stories. So again, I would want it to be um, focused on um, practical hints about how we do this, but to help me focus, can you tell me about why you want to tell a strategic story? Um, oh, I apologize. I hope I have 
Yes, I have launched that. I think it should be out there. If it's not, find it on the 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 website afterwards. Um, I've also made notes of some of the issues that have came up, particularly around data, around previous research, which I could then come back to at the next webinar, which is scheduled for the 3rd of November. Um, so I know I've run one minute over time, but we've covered the psychology of stories. We've covered tools for finding compelling stories, and we've covered sort of a guide for, for structuring stories. But if there's anything else, I will be in the, um, the HPCA community. Uh, my private email address is there, but equally you can probably find me on NH, any NHS directorate because my name is weird and easy to find. Um, but all that remains for me to say is thank you so much for your time, especially straight after lunch. Um, Thank you to Christine and the, and the team at the Healthcare Project and Change Association for inviting me along. Um, yeah, and I would very much like to hear your experience and see how we can build a community of storytelling in change. So yep. I hope this Thank will be the first of many conversations. Yeah, like Bryn said, the next session is on the 3rd of November. Please do go on the K-Hub community and give him your ideas as well, so you can put in free text there. Um, yeah. Although there's been lots of chat. <laughs> yeah, so I'll be done in a couple too. of minutes then. Thanks very much, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, bye. bye. Um, so, yeah, so I put it in the chat, so we hope to see you on the 3rd of November. Um, and we've had over 200 people, so that's fantastic. So well done, everyone. Thank you and have a great day.